Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want you all to do me a favor. Take your Bible out. And uh, go ahead. I want you to go ahead and mark two passages. Put your marker in there. Um, and and for those of you who are you know here today, family and stuff, we've been talking about some interesting topics here the last couple of weeks. And so I want you to uh, put your marker first of all in First Thessalonians chapter four. First Thessalonians chapter four, and then put another marker if you've got one, a bookmark or something, over in First Corinthians chapter fifteen. First Thessalonians chapter four and First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Uh, while you're turning there, let me kind of set this up. As I mentioned, for the, for the past couple weeks, we have been exploring a particular hope that the body of Christ that we have been given in Scripture. Now, hope is something, um, when the Bible uses the word hope, when we see that word in the Bible, it's not something um, that means there's a probability that it could or could not happen. So when the Bible says hope, it's not like, well, I hope this is going to happen, but it might not. That's not what the Bible means when it, when it uses the word hope. The word hope in Scripture means a joyful and confident expectation. It's something that's certain. And so uh, we've been talking about a hope, a certainty uh, that, that's been outlined in Scripture. And this particular hope that we've been given is what we call the rapture. And so we've been, we've been in a discussion. So we're going to continue on that discussion today. And I'm glad y'all, you know, family are here. This will be a good discussion for all of us. Let me just say this just by way of information. The word rapture, and probably, you know, nearly every one of y'all in here probably have heard the word rapture. If you go in your Bible and you go from Genesis all the way to Revelation, you're not going to find the word rapture in there. That word's nowhere to be found. The way we get the, the English word rapture is from the Latin raptura, from the Greek word that is called up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So let's look at this passage. We're going to start in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I want you all to read with me beginning in thir uh, verse 13. And let's read it together. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13. The Apostle Paul says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that is, believers who have already passed on, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, there it is, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? I like that. Underline that. That's an important word there. Let's be reminded to everything we read today, folks, is God breathed. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. To meet the Lord in the air... And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, in a nutshell, and really that's what, what this passage is, it's sort of a summary account, if you will, of a blessed hope that we as the body of Christ have. This thing called the rapture. Now, we've been discussing the specific parts of the rapture um, itself the last couple of weeks, but today what I want to do, I want to take a bit of a turn and today what I want to start, and you know, my family, y'all are going to just get in on the front end of this, but over the next couple of weeks, church, we're going to be really expanding this discussion. But I want to start today to begin a defense of the rapture. Y'all may have heard this word before, apologetics. Apologetics is a, a study of a defense for an argument or, or a particular point. And so today we're going to look at Scripture to defend this idea of a rapture. And so that's what we want to do. Now, I want y'all to listen carefully. And this will sort of frame our discussion today. The first part of our defense um, of a rapture of the body of Christ, or what I'm going to call a pre-tribulation rapture of the body of Christ, is that Israel, as a nation, as God's chosen people, Israel was never promised to be caught up. Not one time. 
ever. Search it. Try me. Try the Scriptures. Israel was never promised to be called up, but Israel is promised. And we're going to see this. We're going to do a bit of an exploration here. Israel is promised an earthly hope, which will begin with the return of the Messiah, that is Christ, their King, and He's coming to the earth. That's significant. We'll explore that more in detail. Now, here's the thing. Since the body of Christ um, today is, is not found anywhere in prophecy, we're going to see this, um, but is born from a different revelation committed to the Apostle Paul. Okay, um, It is not Israel, and it is a different group altogether. When you approach Scripture, Israel and the church, we see that they are separate entities. Okay, And so we'll, we'll look at that here in a minute. Um, Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, the, the body of Christ is a new man. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, a lot of people know this passage. They quote this, really grip onto this one. But, but Paul says we are a new creature. Okay? It's a whole new entity. Okay? Um, and since it just follows then that its, its future, the body of Christ's future, is separate and distinct from what we learn about Israel's future. Um, and here's the thing. Israel's promise uh, will come to fulfillment on earth just as it's prophesied. And we're going to see that again. So let's jump in. Now, here's what I want to do to start off. One of the things when you, when you study Scripture, and we've talked about this a lot, is you, you can't ignore the element of time, the passage of time in Scripture, and the impact that has on your reading of the Word. And so what I want to start with is I'm going to draw a timeline here, and then as we study the Scriptures, we'll kind of you know, look back at the timeline, and you guys will kind of see how all these things work together. So let's start here. Um, here's our timeline right here. All the way back in the beginning, y'all know what happened. God created the heavens and the earth and all these things. Now, as you come forward in time... God makes a decision based on His own foreknowledge, based on His own wisdom. He chooses a man, a Hebrew-speaking man from a land over there that's modern-day Iraq between the Tigris and Euphrates River. Guy's hanging out there, and his name is Abram. Okay? And God chooses this man, and what He's going to do is He's going to enter into a covenant with Abram. Okay? You can, and we don't have time to get into this. Y'all can go on YouTube and look at Liberty Bible Church, Tuscumbia, and y'all can go back and study some of this stuff because I just don't have time to get into it today. But the, God began to enter into a covenant with Abram, and in that covenant, He made promises. Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 17, especially, is a real summary of the Abrahamic covenant. So back here, God starts these covenants with these people. The first, I'm going to write them up here, the Abrahamic covenant covenant. In the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 17, we find that God promises Abraham that he's going to be the father of many nations. That's why he changed his name from Abram to Abraham. He took his name from being a singular word to a plural word because he was not going to be the father of one. He was going to be the father of many. And that's according to promise. He promised him he'd be a father of many nations through his seed. He'd bless the whole world. He also promised him a land a very rich, fertile piece of land. That still stands today. And all that's part of that Abrahamic covenant. As we move forward in time, then God enters into another uh, covenant. Now, remember, God takes this man Abraham and his wife Sarah, and they have a baby Isaac, then Jacob, and on down the line. We get all these descendants of Abraham, and they're all this promising. Eventually, this family starts to grow, but then they end up in bondage to Egypt. They're in slavery. Y'all know the story from VBS and all that stuff. What happened? God delivered these people out of Egyptian bondage. He brings them out into the wilderness. Now, as He brings them out into the wilderness, He takes this family, and now He's going to form them into a nation. Y'all take your Bibles and go with me to Exodus chapter 19. Now, it was this family that God entered into another covenant with there at Mount Sinai, and He's going to make them a nation, but not just any old nation. He's going to make them a favored nation, and He's going to give them a very specific and a very special promise. So y'all go with me to Exodus. I promised myself I wouldn't do this. I can't pass this up. It's too good. All right, so Exodus chapter 19. I have in my notes, Greg, just keep rolling. I can't do it, though. All right, Exodus chapter 19. It's too much good. Y'all, we usually get out normally about 3 o'clock. Is that okay with y'all? I'm kidding. Look, y'all, hey... 
Church, did y'all see my family? They're like, nah, that ain't cool at all. No, I'm kidding. Everybody start walking out. <laughs> Look what happens. So, so God, you know, He chooses Moses as a, as a spokesperson, if you will, for this family. Now He's going to make them a nation. But listen what He promises them. Go back to, um, uh, well, come back to verse 3. Uh, Exodus chapter 19, verse 3, And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Remember, God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you'll obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be, what? A peculiar treasure unto me. Now look at this next phrase. Above all people for all the earth is mine and ye shall be unto me what a kingdom of priests boy that's significant and a holy nation the word holy here has less to do with morality and ethics as much as it does about being just literally separated different unique okay Almost weird, <laughs> especially in the eyes of the rest of the world. And he says, These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So here we have the Mosaic Covenant. Now, Abrahamic Covenant, father of many nations, a blessed seed will come from him, going to bless all the nations of the earth. Now he's going to take that family, he's going to make them into a holy nation, a separated nation, because he's got a plan to make them a kingdom of priests. Now, a priest is a mediator between God and man. Now, with that, we're going to see in some other covenants that God's going to enter into, there's some particular hoops to jump through in order to, to serve as priests in a kingdom. Okay, we'll see that here in a minute. But he says, I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests. Well, what's a kingdom of priests without a kingdom, right? So we'll look at that here in a minute. And then also, by the way, this is going to be connected to a promised land. So there's the next covenant. Now, after he enters into the Mosaic covenant, we get another covenant. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. All right, so my family, y'all listen. I told you our name is Liberty Bible Church. The Bible is our focus. Today, this is a Bible study. That's all we do here, right, church? That's what we're about. And we've learned that's the most liberating thing on planet Earth, isn't it? And uh, so I hope, you, I hope you can appreciate this. All right, so then we get in Deuteronomy chapter 30, this thing called the Palestinian Covenant. And I've got to go real quick on this, otherwise we're not going to have time. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Look with me in verse 1. So God's made this, this family now a nation. They're a holy nation. They're separate. He's going to make them a kingdom priest. He's going to bring them into the promised land. And that's exactly what the Palestinian covenant promises. He says in verse 1, And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey His voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Now look at verse 3. That then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. You know God is actually fulfilling that today. Israel for the longest time since the time of the Babylonian captivity was scattered as a nation all over the earth. In fact, for the longest time up until here in the last five or ten years, the largest concentration of Jews was actually outside the Promised Land. New York City was actually the highest concentration. That's not so anymore. You know, Jerusalem is now the highest concentration of Jews on planet Earth today. But still, not all Israel has regathered. But God is still fulfilling that covenant promise. He's bringing them back, even though they've played the harlot. That's part of a covenant that God has made with them. He says, I'll bring you back in. Verse 4, If any of thine be driven out unto the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. And on and on we go. But we, we get what's called the Palestinian covenant. So, we got promised land, promised people, holy nation, kingdom of priests, and a promise that they're going to be able to come back to their promised land. So we've got this people, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, but again, what's a kingdom of priests without a kingdom, right? 
Well, the next covenant God enters into is what we call the Davidic covenant. Now, y'all know old David. Y'all know the story of David. A man after God's own heart is what we hear Luke call him in in the book of Acts. A man after God's own heart. Now, God's going to take David of the tribe of Benjamin, one of these uh, Israelites from the seed of Abraham. He's going to enter into a covenant with David because David is a favored man. Now, what's he going to promise David? Y'all turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 7. I know y'all may be thinking, what in the world does this have to do with the rapture? Hang in there. I promise you, we're going to tie it all together. Boy, it's going to be great. All right, 2 Samuel chapter 7. So Dan, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, God's going to speak to old David and he's going to enter into another covenant. Now listen to what he says. 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 12. And when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, he's talking to David, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. In other words, his kids. First one, Solomon. Okay, uh, And I will establish his what? Kingdom. See, now what God's going to do is He's going to set up a kingdom. This is, by the way, not some idea of a kingdom. This is a real, legitimate kingdom with what you're going to see here, a kingdom of priests and a king. He goes on, he says, verse 13, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of His kingdom. How long? A lot. That's right. Forever. Good job, Kaylee. Yeah, I'm telling you, kids, they learn. They can, they can understand this stuff. Verse 14, I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. So with the Davidic covenant, we get the establishment of a kingdom and a throne. Okay? Now, when we move forward from here, y'all turn to Ezekiel chapter 36. God's going to enter into another covenant. Ezekiel. Okay, so you got Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Okay? From, uh, from 2 Samuel, take a right turn, go about two miles. That's our, that's our directional system here, right? <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 36. Now, we see this covenant not only in Ezekiel 36, we see it in Jeremiah 31 and other places. Even we, we get parts and pieces of it over in the book of Hebrews. But I want to show you here from the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 36. Elijah's like, y'all skip my name in the Bible. That's what he's upset about. Ezekiel chapter 36. Now, in this new covenant, this is one, to be quite honest with you, in a lot of sermons, there's a lot of fooling around going on with this covenant. Because there's a lot of people that believe we are now experiencing the new covenant in full. We are getting taste of it. But let me show you what's going on here. Ezekiel chapter 36. Now, this is all Israel so far. Okay? God's going to enter into another covenant with them. Uh, come all the way down um, to verse 22. Ezekiel 36, verse 22. Therefore, and this is God speaking to Ezekiel to speak to Israel. He says, Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, for but mine own holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen. By the way, we're the heathen. Gentiles are. Whither ye went... And I will sanctify my great name, uh, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries. Does that sound familiar? He had already promised that, hasn't he? In the Palestinian covenant, back there in Deuteronomy chapter 30. He says, I will gather you from among the heathen, and I'll gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into what? Your own land. What land? Well, the one He promised back there to Abraham. And He goes on, verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. What's that about? Well, remember, 
if you will, you have to go back in your own time and study this, to be a priest before you could go in the Holy of Holies and do service unto the Lord for the people, you first had to be washed. Hence, when you come into the New Testament, they required water baptism. And that's also why when they were being water baptized, they came confessing their sins. And that's why Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. He was speaking to Jews. They were going to be a kingdom of priests. They had to be washed. And so this is part of this new covenant. He says, And I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your, uh, all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Now listen to this next part. Again, this is to Israel. He says, A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you. Now look at this next part. And cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Yeah, I'm telling you right now, not a one of us in here has fulfilled that, have we? I know Chris Reed had <laughs> Amen, full of iniquity. Can I get a witness, you know? Uh, hey, but as bad as he is, Truman over there, woo, y'all, terrible. <laughs> He's like, man, I sat over here in the corner to disappear. I'm not going to call out my family because I'm trying to be nice to him today. Uh, but, but listen, <laughs> Chris is not family. He married him. <laughs> But he said, he said, I'll take away the stony heart. And he said, I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Verse 20, uh, 27. And ye, uh, ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Verse 28. And ye shall dwell in, that, in the land that I gave to your fathers and ye shall be my people and I'll be your God. Alright, pause right here. Who here is Israel? None of you. We're not Israel, are we? He says, And I, ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I'll be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness. We'll see that crop up again over in uh, Romans chapter 11, verse uh, 26, I believe it is, 26, 27. I will also save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the corn and will increase it and lay no famine upon you. There's a prophecy concerning a future kingdom we're going to talk about here in just a second. But here God makes a covenant, a new covenant. Now, here's what's going to happen. After God makes these covenants, we come forward in time and we get the time of the prophets. Ezekiel being one of those, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all these guys. And God is going to speak through the mouth of His prophets. And then as we come forward in time, a significant event starts to happen. God's going to now start fulfilling some of these prophecies that He's laid down. One of the first major prophecies that He's going to fulfill is what we call the first advent. That is Christ, the Son of God, coming to earth. We're going to talk about that here in detail in just a minute. Jesus comes to earth, He ministers, and then guess what happens? Death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? Not long after His death, His burial, and His resurrection, then what does He do? He's on earth for just a tiny amount of time, and then we get what's called the ascension. That's where Jesus goes up to heaven after, after speaking with His disciples. Why did He go to heaven? Scripture tells us if He doesn't come, He can't send the comfort, the parakletos, the Holy Spirit. That happens at Pentecost. A major event, which, by the way, is part of prophecy. If you go over to Acts chapter 2, verse 16, uh, when Peter stands to preach, everybody's saying, what in the world's going on? And Peter said, this is that which was spoken of in the prophet Joel. This is all part and parcel of the prophecies that have already been spoken. Okay? Now, so Pentecost happens. From there, guess what those twelve are supposed to do? they got to go preaching. Who are they going to go to? Israel. Okay? Now, as we come forward in time, we get another significant event. We get a signing of a seven-year agreement between the Antichrist and Israel, promising them peace and safety. And, and Scripture indicates so much so that Israel's going to totally let down their guard. They're going to put all their hope in this man that they think has all the power and all the authority and can do anything he wants. And so they're going to let down their guard. And they're going to say, peace and safety, man, we got it. But halfway through this seven-year period, we get what's called the abomination that causes desolation. You can find it in Daniel chapter 9. You can find it in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. But the Antichrist is going to set himself up as God in a temple that's going to be built. By the way, that's in the making already. Today, it's in the making. I'm telling you, prophecy is being fulfilled today. Now, so we're going to get seven years of what we call the tribulation on earth. The second ha half is what we call the great tribulation. Old Testament call, calls it the day of Jacob's trouble. 
because the second half is going to be much worse than the first half. Now, what's going to end the tribulation period? Any takers? Anybody? What you got, Chris? You got it, man. You didn't sound too confident. What's up? You scared? <laughs> All right, so after that, I got to pick on Chris, y'all. All right, because he's real smart, real smart. Um, a lot smarter than me. Uh, the second advent. Now, at this point, prophecy, again, is going to come to fulfillment. Jesus Christ, y'all can see this, uh, Zechariah, if you're taking it, Zechariah chapter 13, verses 8 and 9, Jesus is very literally going to land on planet Earth. It's a very specific prophecy. In fact, He's going to land on the Mount of Olives, and it's going to split in two. Part of it's going to go to the north, part of it to the south, part of it toward the sea, part of it toward the hinder sea, and all this stuff. He's going to land on the Mount of Olives. When he comes, he's going to settle business real quick. And according to Revelation chapter 19, he's going to rule the world with an iron fist. He's going to bring peace on earth. That'll be the next time, folks, there will be peace on earth. I don't care what president we elect. I don't care who the diplomats are. The next time there will be peace on earth is when the Lord Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, comes to earth. That's when it's going to happen. Now, I mean, shortly after this, According to the prophetic scriptures, Old Testament scriptures, there's going to be a resurrection. Okay? It's going to be a resurrection. We'll talk about that another time. But uh, resurrection. And then Jesus is going to set up what's called this thing. We just looked at this thing that's been promised, right? Back here. The kingdom. Now, the first time we get any detail regarding the length of this kingdom on the earth, on this earth, is over in Revelation. And it's going to be how long? A thousand years. Hence, it's called the millennial Kingdom. A millennium is a thousand years. So, a thousand year reign of Christ on earth. There are a lot of preachers out there that say, oh, well, that's not a literal thousand years. Well, the scripture doesn't tell us to take that symbolically. So, for my money, I'm going to take it literally because I believe God doesn't make mistakes when He inspired His Word. <laughs> he knew what He meant. For a short time afterward, the scripture tells us Satan's going to be released for a time. He has to be. These people who have been saved during the kingdom, they, their faith has to be tested just like yours does. Once that's wrapped up, we get the great white throne judgment. There's going to be a resurrection just before that. That's going to be the second resurrection. That's going to be a bad one. You don't want to be a part of that one. That's the uh, resurrection of the unjust of all time. Unsaved of all time will appear before there. And then after that, we get the eternal order. 